right, Danny, we're back for another episode. And as I said a month and a half ago, they're not dead yet. They are not dead yet. They are extremely alive right now. Uh, they are more alive than uh, than the Philadelphia Flyers are. They're more alive than the Buffalo Sabres. They're more alive than the Washington Capitals. Maybe a little less alive than like maybe Detroit or New York Islanders right now. But they're alive, man. We are. We have an opportunity to watch some playoff hockey if the next four games go the Penguins' way. You know, a lottery pick in the draft would have been very cool. But I'm totally 100% fine with punting on that to watch Sidney Crosby in the postseason. Now, granted, they, they still have a pretty tough task ahead oh, to yeah. get in. I'm, this is not to suggest that they're an automatic in here at this point. But I will trade that lottery pick 10 times out of 10 to watch Sidney Crosby in the postseason with the level that he's still playing at. And I also think with the way we've seen Evgeny Malkin heating up down the stretch and really finding some chemistry with Michael Bunting. Yeah. And I also think that Eric Carlson is playing some very, very well-rounded hockey right now. Uh, and, you know, I, I know this is not prime Eric Carlson that we're talking about, but the dude is a postseason performer too. So we're talking about three future Hall of Famers, and then we can throw Chris Letang into the mix, too, mm -hmm. of, and granted, he hasn't been playing very well at all. I think he's cleaned it up a little bit the past couple games. Uh, March was tough for him. But regardless, seeing those four guys in the postseason, like, I, I'm not expecting them to go on any sort of cup run. I'd still be surprised if they even win a series. Granted, it could happen with the way they've been playing over the past several weeks. But seeing those guys in the postseason really trumps all else because if you really go back and look at what the goal and the objective was heading into this season and what all the moves were tailored around last offseason, it was just getting those guys back into the dance to give them one more shot. And we, you and I have been super critical, I think rightly so, for a lot of this season. Yeah, yeah, no and doubt. And, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that just making the postseason, you chalk it up as a success because that was your intended goal going in. But it, it's it's hard. It's going to be hard to be disappointed if they do end up making it, regardless of what happens. Yeah. And, and look, we they're probably going to play New York, maybe Carolina, maybe Boston. It's going to be one of those three teams we can pretty much lock in that is going to be the Penguins first round opponent. Uh, they're not going to have home ice for these uh, for these series. Obviously, uh, they're either going to be the third seed in the e in the Metro or the second playoff, uh, second wild card spot. So no no home ice advantage for it. Uh, but honestly, I think they play well against the Rangers, and I don't think that Carolina is a terrible matchup for them. I don't think it's a great matchup, but I don't think it's a terrible matchup for them. Uh, the the team I'd be not wanting to see is Boston. And I don't. I would much rather go through the metro side of the of the bracket than the Atlantic side of the bracket because you're going to get if you get Boston in the first round, you're getting one of Toronto or uh, or Florida in the second. And I don't think the Penguins particularly match up well against either of them. Uh, they don't defend very well as a team, the Penguins. And as we saw last night uh, on on Monday night, the uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs have a lot of firepower. And while the Penguins held them at bay. Uh, Austin Matthews scored on the what three seconds into the power play. Yeah, I mean and when you it, Matthews is like one of yeah. very few game actual game breakers yeah. around the league, and we saw it. Like the, I thought the Penguins played pretty well for the most part. Uh, the effort was there. I mean the, the Leafs played an okay game. I didn't think they had a lot going for them, but all of a sudden at the snap of a finger, Matthews is putting the puck in the back of the net with Changes a shot that nobody's yep. going to stop. Yep. So I you know I I think the Rangers are the team you circle is. And it's funny because they're probably going to be the president's trophy team. Right. <laughs> I, I Not that the Rangers are bad, but like I don't. Uh, and, and granted, they've got Shesterkin and they, you know, they've they've got some dogs up yeah. front at forward. They're they're not a bad team. But the Penguins team. know them. They've had success against them. Even as the last playoff uh, appearance, the Penguins had them up 3-1. And if they don't have their third string goalie in that uh, eating uh you know, spicy pork and broccoli or chicken and broccoli, uh, they may, they probably win that series easily. So 
I'm not, it's not that I am taking the Rangers lightly. And honestly, they're going to go in as a favorite to probably win it in five or six. Uh, but I think that that's the best chance the Penguins have of moving on to the second round is if they end up matching up against the Rangers strictly on matchup. Again, not taking anything away from the Rangers as a hockey team. Like you said, they have, they have some players. Um, I just think that that's the best matchup for the Pens. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I don't see the Rangers as like a terrible matchup for the Penguins. Mm-hmm. I That's not to say that I would favor the Penguins going no, into that no. series. I don't think... It, I don't think you, anyone would. No, I uh, just in general, I don't think you could favor the Penguins in any series, regardless of who they're playing at this yeah, point. Yeah, I would agree and, with that. And I don't really think they've earned that benefit of the doubt, regardless of how they've played here over the past couple of weeks. But I would also say, if you're, if you're looking at this from the Rangers' perspective or Carolina's perspective or you know, Boston's perspective, you probably don't want to see a hot Sidney Crosby with a hot Evgeny Malkin with a Chris Letang who's figuring his game out and an Eric Carlson who's playing a well-rounded game. I don't think that's what you want to see in the playoffs. All of these guys have Stanley Cup experience minus Eric Carlson, but he's got a ton of playoff experience. People forget that when he was on the uh, Ottawa Senators, they did play in the playoffs. They did have some runs. They they made it to the – they made it – you know, a shot, a Chris Kunitz knuckleball away from uh, going to the Stanley Cup Finals. Right, and and he was their top player yeah. on that team. Uh, by remember a mile. that pass he made, like that that like almost ice length pass yeah. that he like he flipped it to to his forward, and it, I mean, like he was out of his mind then. Uh, I mean, I mean, there there were discussions about him being the third best player in the league at that point uh-huh. in time behind Crosby and McDavid. Yeah, so. Point being, that's not the version of Eric Carlson no, that no. the Penguins have, but he has playoff experience. He has deep playoff experience. So I don't think that one of these teams want to see the Penguins in the first round. I feel like they're they're looking at it. If we could avoid Crosby, Malkin, and Carlson, and Latang, we'd like to avoid that. But at the same time, like you said, they don't have the they haven't earned that benefit of a doubt to be a favorite. Uh, Switch gears a little bit, uh, get off the positivity a little, <laughs> because that's what we're all about. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be breakdowns and breakaways if it was all positive, right? Um, what is with the with Mike Sullivan's? Decision? Oh, you're jumping into it. I'm now. jumping right into it. No, it. no, we're jumping right into it. I let's let's go with he, that. Sidney Crosby had a skate issue. Why Lars Eller and Drew O'Connor, and why not Rust and Malkin or Bunting well, and Malkin? Are you going to tell or... everybody what you're talking about? Yeah, okay, I know what okay. you're talking so about. So, if for those who live under a rock and don't pay attention, last uh, Tuesday, Monday night against the Toronto Maple Leafs, game goes to overtime. Rather than starting Crosby and Rust, or Crosby and Bunting, or Malkin and Rust, or Malkin and Bunting, or however you want to slice it. Uh, Mike Sullivan decides to go with Lars Eller and Drew O'Connor, presumably to win that opening faceoff. Even though Sidney Crosby is the number one faceoff guy in the in the league, I digress. They claim that Sidney Crosby had a skate issue, which he did have a skate issue in between periods or at some point in time did. in the second he, period. He was he switched skate skates, yeah. He, off so numerous times. there there was some issues there, but you still have Evgeny Malkin. I understand wanting to again. I understand w- wanting to win that f- opening face off because possession matters in three on three. But that seems incredibly dumb to me. I, I mean that it seems very short sighted, in the truest sense of that term, uh, because Lars Eller and Drew O'Connor got stuck on the ice for the entirety of the overtime. Well, and- uh, uh, I'm going to stop you there. Why did they get stuck on the ice, Eddie? Why did they get stuck out there? Do you remember what happened? They got, they got hemmed in. Well, they got hemmed in, but why were they getting hemmed in? It was because Eller fired a hopeless shot that missed the net, went straight into the corner, and rolled up sure. the boards. But why? Why? Just like that whole sit. Like why? Pick pick a why and, so, and explain it to me. Go back to last season. I, Sullivan has been galaxy braining his overtime decisions dating back to last season it was maybe halfway through the year and it's funny Sullivan actually found out about this uh from an article that Taylor Haas wrote uh at the time and and like obviously the players and and coaches are are reading the stuff that the credentialed media is writing um the Penguins lost an overtime game and Taylor who was my beat partner at the time obviously 
she wrote an article talking about their overtime struggles, or maybe it was just a bullet point in her game story, whatever it was. But she noted that Crosby was like either over on opening draws in overtime or like a, a very poor faceoff win percentage to start overtime. Well, Sullivan read it, went to somebody in PR and asked them to confirm that, which caught me, took me aback a little bit because I was like, is that not something you have your stats you guys should, do? Yeah, or shouldn't that, that be a stat that you're aware of? Anyway, when he confirmed it, that was when we started getting Jeff Carter taking the opening draws in overtime last season, which okay. was ridiculous because even if he's winning the draw, you still got to worry about getting him off the ice. And I know it's, oh, you win the draw and you get him off. But as we've seen, it is not that simple. Even last night's game, how easy would it have been for Eller and O'Connor to get off after they had possession of the puck? Well, I don't know, because when you have possession of the puck and it's three on three, you think you're going to go down the ice and score. But if you're Lars Eller, you rip a shot from the top of the left circle and yeah. miss by a million miles. So anyway, like, here's the thing. Going into last night, and it's still true because Crosby and Malkin didn't even hit the ice, but this season in overtime, Crosby's outscored on the ice five to nothing. The Penguins have not scored with him on the ice in overtime, and they've given up five. With Malkin on the ice in overtime, they've been outscored three to two. Okay. Not great results, especially for Crosby. I can understand wanting to switch it up and try and do something different. Like everybody's all over Sullivan, and I've been over him at times for mm -hmm. not changing things up. I don't have a problem with changing things up. I have a problem changing things up when it's the biggest overtime of the season in a playoff run, and you have two future Hall of Famers who could go out there. Let's exclude Crosby. Let's just say it's Malkin, because Crosby skate issue. Let's say that was legitimate, okay? Which it very, very well, well Yeah, it probably was. I, I, I don't. There's no reason to distrust them. Right. I have a problem with it when the alternative option is trotting Lars Eller and Drew O'Connor out there. And no disrespect to them, but Eller throughout the game, and I don't know what the final numbers were, but through the first two periods of the game, Eller had been out attempted by 15 shot attempts at five on five. So you can't even make the argument that, oh, Eller, you know, he had some juice that game or that night and that he was really rolling. Right. And on the flip side of that, you could absolutely make that case for Malkin because his line has he been all, buzzing. He, yeah, they were all over the place last night. And even if you want to tell me, oh, well, Malkin's not a great face-off guy, Malkin's not good defensively, you know what? Are you telling me that, one, the, you know, face-offs are a coin flip. I know I know, guys. some guys are better at it than others are. But when it's one draw in overtime and you have a chance to get a Malkin out there who is buzzing, regardless of whether Austin Matthews and Mitch Barner are out there, you're going to tell me that having Lars Eller out, out there is better? Really? And I, like, I'm a big Drew O'Connor fan, and the, the steps that he's taken this year to yeah. round out his game and become – I still don't see him as a future like top-of-the-lineup guy, but he's at least showed that he can play up there in pinches and has really established himself as a nice – piece for the middle of the lineup but bunting's been rolling ricard raquel's been playing really mm -hmm. well Brian yeah, Rust has been playing this, yeah. really well why is o'connor the first one out there like it seems to me that the whole overtime strategy here is that they're going to concede the opening shift and hope to fight another day with their stars against lower level competition which is asinine to me yeah. And I, I think it was uh, Matt Geica on Twitter responded because I, I was going off on Sullivan for not getting Crosby mm -hmm. and Malkin out there for the overtime. And I think it was Matt Geica that responded and was like, I don't care if Crosby's been, out, been outscored 50 to nothing at overtime. He is your guy out there. And again, skate issue or not, same could be said for Evgeny Malkin, yeah. especially with the way he's been playing. So like to me, this is overcoaching 101. And I know there's like layers to this and I tried to go through them a little bit, but there, I have a very, very tough time coming to a point where I can justify the decision that Sullivan made in that overtime. You know, the irony in all of this, Danny, what's that? Uh, so I, as, as everyone knows by now, my, my mistress team is the Toronto Maple Leafs. I, I follow a lot of podcasts and, you know, hockey writers and that cover the Leafs. And at the beginning of the season, do you know what one of the knocks on Sheldon Keefe was? What's that? He was putting out uh, David Kampf 
I as actually their, saw a tweet about that uh, last about, night. As their start, starting center in overtime. Who started overtime for the uh, for the Leafs last, last night? Austin Austin Matthews, Matthews and Mitch. So even they figured it out that, you know what? No, probably the way to go is put your star out early and hope for the best. Um, it's just ironic to me that that's why the Penguins lost and they lost to a team that figured it out. And... You know, I, I know people were saying, oh, well, this isn't on Mike Sullivan. Sid had a skate issue, and I don't know. They would have... The fact of the matter is, like you said, they still had Evgeny Malkin. They still had other players that could have been on the ice. I'm not going to rehash everything you just said. They still had other players, and it absolutely is on Mike Sullivan and his coaching staff because at the end of the day, Mike Sullivan got outcoached in overtime, and it cost the Penguins a very, very needed point in this playoff race. And now they're past the point of no return because if they'd finish outside of the playoffs, now they're still giving up that first-round pick to, to San Jose. They're not catching a top-10 pick now. That's not happening right? unless – a miracle happens no, with the lottery I, I, balls. I'm pretty it, sure it's like yeah, so, almost out of the question. So yeah, it's like a 0.5 percent or something like that uh, if, to to move into the top ten if you're not in. So yeah, it's this is they are you know co- like f- alert five you know what is it? Um, threat level midnight you know like that's yeah, where they're yeah. that's where they're at right now uh for the and, and for the office the, fans this isn't the first time it's happened no right like it, it's a it's that, that's becoming what, a thing well that's what's funny to me is that like um and, and i didn't hear sullivan's post-game press conference i just saw all the tweets and the notes yeah. about what he said and that crosby had a skate issue and that's why he didn't start overtime if crosby didn't have that skate issue i'm he not still so sure because overtime. you know who's been starting overtime lars the past eller. few times lars eller yeah. and it started earlier in the season several months back after you know again crosby has not at least and i don't think crosby himself has played all that great in overtime but going back to what i said earlier yeah. he's your guy you ride exactly. with him and but there was a game earlier in the year. I think it was the first time it had happened. Riley Smith was mired in like probably his worst stretch of the year. Mm-hmm. And Eller had just been, you know, doing Lars Eller things at that point in time of the season. I forget who they were playing, but they trotted Eller and Smith out there to start this overtime and they lost. It makes, yeah. And I mean, like it's to the point now, I, I this isn't you have to be a hockey guy or a hockey person to understand this. Like this has gone to the point where. Alex Stumpf, the beat writer for MLB.com that covers the Pittsburgh Pirates. Did you see his tweet this, I today? Did. Go ahead and share it for he's, he's They had a picture of Sidney Crosby up on the uh, on the big screen at PNC Park. And uh, Alex Stumpf quote tweeted a uh, tweet from Noah Hiles. And um, Stumpf said, second straight day where Sid can only watch with the game on the line. So good. It's such a good tweet, man, because everyone sees it now. This this has become a thing, and look, we don't need to beat a dead horse. It is what it is. The game's over and done with. They have four very important games left, and very winnable games too. Um, that I I think that they can get into the playoffs. And honestly, if you put a gun to my head right now, I would probably say that it's going to be them and the Islanders that make it. Yeah, I think so um, too. And if it's not them and the Islanders, I think that last game against the Islanders is going decide to decide which one of those two make it. So they've got, you know, they still play Detroit too. I mean, that's another big one that, you know, against a team that is in this. So they, they still hold the cards in their hands to make this happen. Their destiny is is right there for the taking for them, as long as they don't fumble it like they did last season against Chicago. Uh, but I do think this team is a little is in a little different headspace than they were at the end of the season last year. I, I think they are, they're the aggressors now. I think that they have been even with the Lightning when they gave up the the three go- or the you know they gave up the three goal lead in the third period. That game never felt like it was slipping out of their hands to the point where they couldn't win it. And obviously, Michael Bunting scores in the third period. Right. They, they come out on top. They just there's a different feel about this team right now where even if they're down two nothing, the game's not out of reach. Like that whole time they were down two one to the Leafs, the game never felt like it was over. You know, like it never felt like oh, the Penguins aren't getting that goal. Like there's di- there's a different feel about this team. And that's why I hope that Sullivan and the coaching staff doesn't get in the way of the players because the players feel like they actually have a little magic to them. Yeah, I mean, the, I definitely think there's an element here. And this is 
obviously after most of the teams started pouting after the trade deadline that they moved Gensel yeah. and uh, you know, even I know he's not a huge name, but Chad Ruedel has been around forever with mo- all the guys that are still there. Uh, he's a vibe that guy been for there them. for a while. Yeah. Uh, and I know he had good relationships with guys like Brian Rust, for instance. So uh, once they quit pouting, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. and I lump the entire team into yeah. that, yeah. not just a couple of players, um, but they've been playing with this like backs against their backs against the wall mentality. And I think that Above all else, maybe Sidney Crosby and his drive, although I'd argue that Malkin has had just as much of a hand in it. Uh, But that backs against the wall mentality has really been what's driving the results that we're seeing right now. And again, I know they are playing very well. Their record over this last little stretch is phenomenal. I just six zero and two or seven zero and two. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's strong, and I think they. I don't know the exact date, but they've they've been the best team in the NHL points wise over that stretch. It's just funny to me that like if every other team in this playoff race hadn't been peeing down their leg it over the matter. past couple of the weeks, it one hundred percent wouldn't have mattered. So that they, they absolutely deserve credit because when they when Mike Sullivan and all the players were like, Yeah, we're still gonna try and make the postseason, like, oh, we still gotta just take it one game at a time. I was clowning them. Everybody was clowning them because it's like, look, we we know what's going on yeah. here. I know we know you guys got to say it, but you're not getting it in. You're you're toast. And the fact you, you gotta remember that the rest of the East or at least they the middle of the back yet. stinks. But they do deserve some credit yeah. for staying in it because the the mental fortitude you have to have to be able to do what they've done is, I think, significant. Yeah, the, the la- like where I want to end this conversation. It, it came up, uh, I think, on Thursday or Friday night. Uh, Elliot Friedman had tweeted out about you know Sidney Crosby being in the Hart Trophy race if if the Penguins were to make the playoffs. Where do you stand on that? Uh, I like. I know where you stand on it. I think he should be. <laughs> Personally, and I and I, I broke it down on Twitter the other day, um, just looking at his point share, you know, and and looking at you know the next closest person on the team. Now that's changed because Malkin has been on fire, so that's changed a little bit. But the only person that you can compare him to, as far as percentage of points, or like you know, like the the amount of points he has compared to his next teammate, um, is Nikita Kucherov, who I absolutely think right now should be the Hart Trophy winner. Um, but I think Sid should get a finalist nomination. I know he's not going to because Nathan McKinnon and and Connor McDavid exist, and they both are you know up over 125 points. And the th- those three Kucherov, McKinnon, and McDavid are probably going to be your finalists. But I do. How th- crazy is it that we might end up with a 70 goal scorer who has really strong and defensive won't impacts? Won't even make the top even, four. He won't even be a, a finalist. Yeah, scorer. he might not even make a top four. Well, it, so it's going to be, your, it's I know be him and Sid are going to be fighting for number four. Well, th- what I just said is exactly why I don't think Crosby belongs in the conversation. And that's not to take away anything from Sidney Crosby. And I know what you're going to respond with. But here's my thing. I think the lines are so blurred on how the MVP should actually be selected, right? Okay. And I know the wording of it, most valuable to his individual team, right? right? And I hate the arbitrary, you know, oh, your team missed the playoffs, so you can't be a heart, you can't be a, yeah. a heart candidate. And oh, I don't like oh, that either because Taylor Hall, the, the year he won, should not have won it. That should have been McDavid's trophy. Excuse so I, I hate the I hate the arbitrary lines that are drawn there. Mm-hmm. But in my eyes, MVP should go to best overall player, most impactful. Isn't player. that the Ted Lindsay? Well, voted on by the players, which I take more, I, I put more weight on personally. I don't know that I put more weight on that because I, I don't know that I would agree that a, an NHL player is the greatest analyst either. Not to say that that's a whole different conversation. What I'm getting at here is that if you really start to break it down, and Crosby's had a phenomenal season especially considering his age and especially considering the state of the Penguins. But if you're really breaking it down and taking the Penguins goggles off here, and I'm not saying that you have them on, but if you break it down, it's really hard to make a case that he's uh, been more valuable than a lot of these guys. You can make the argument that the second most uh, valuable player to the team is playing in Carolina right now. You could make that argument. Okay. All right. So now 
and again, not taking anything away from Evgeny Malkin, especially how he's played over the last two weeks. But Malkin's not even the second most valuable player on the team. It's Jake Gensel. So Crosby is playing with other guys that are not providing a significant value to this team for the totality of the season. He has dictionary definition strapped this team to his back and got them to, got them to where they are. And he's finally, over the last two weeks, got some help. I agree. But I understand because we are... We've gone back to the 80s almost in early 90s and how points are being produced in, in the NHL and scoring is, is happening in the NHL, which I don't think is a bad thing personally. I think no, that's, I love it. Yeah, I love it too. Um, but because – I don't want to use the word inflated, but because McDavid and McKinnon and Kucherov and you know some of the other guys in the NHL are putting up numbers that we're not used to seeing, they're getting these votes. But I would say – Look at the players they have around him, them. Look at Leon Dreisaitl. Look at uh, you know everyone that McKinnon's playing. Kale McCarr and uh, Rantanen, and you know look at who's on Colorado's hockey team. No, look I look at I, I look get at it. who even Kucherov has Braden Point and Steven Stamkos, who are in a closer. You know, in my in my eyes, I know statistically they're not, but they're closer to him. Even goals scored, uh, Braden points tied with him for the team team lead. So they have other players on the team that are significantly adding to the the value of that hockey team, where Sid up until two weeks ago has not. And so I don't think that that's enough for him to win it. I want to be perfectly clear there. I don't think that's enough for him to win it, but I do think that he should be in the conversation with McDavid, McKinnon, and Kucherov. I think he absolutely should be in that conversation. And by extension, I think Austin Matthews should be in that conversation as well because we haven't seen what Austin Matthews is doing in in the cap era. Well, just as it relates to Matthews, like I know I, know I mentioned, mentioned it a minute ago, but the fact that he's scoring as many goals as he is and, and his defensive metrics are legitimately outstanding. Yeah. And I think they're, you know, if, if you truly are looking at the overall value of a player and, and looking at both sides of the puck and not just looking at point totals here, I think Matthews has a very good case to okay. maybe be the MVP. Anyway, I, I absolutely get what you're saying that McKinnon has better teammates to play with. And those are going to those players are obviously going right. to help him inflate, inflate, quote unquote, his point totals. That being said, I don't think it is enough to account for the massive gap. And, and again, Crosby's, what, 14th in the league in points, yeah, but also like if that. you're going to go to Austin Matthews' defensive metrics, Crosby's defensive metrics are are better. Boo -boo. No, they're not. You don't. They're not better than no. McDavid and McKinnon? No. And no. Crosby's been replacement level. Def and here's the thing. So, like, there was a play last night, for instance, okay. uh, third period. I think the Penguins had just tied it or they were trying to tie it up. It was right before the goal or right after Drew O'Connor's goal. Penguins have an offensive zone possession. Pucks getting the Maple Leafs game possession and are working the puck up ice. Crosby is the deepest forward in the offensive zone, recognized the change of possession, and beelined it through the middle of the ice and took a perfect angle to essentially run into William Nylander and stick check him to cause a turnover. Okay. When Crosby is dialed in and playing like that, I think he absolutely is the most complete player. So I, I view that as like defensive attributes. But with the way that Crosby has sacrificed some of his defensive play to help him help his offensive game stay at a high level. And there's also been points in time at the of the year. Uh, I could go back to the last time the Penguins played the Rangers. There was a, a like an absolute ole moment where Crosby was on the complete wrong side of the ice, mm -hmm. loop behind the net, and then all of a sudden. Uh, I think it was Adam Fox walked right to the middle of the ice and scored. And all the other four, all other four Penguin skaters out there had their guys accounted for. And I think because we see this completeness from Crosby in these moments and we see those attributes, we automatically think that it leads to results. But if you actually look at the results and the impacts, it hasn't been there over the course of the season. There you have it, folks. Danny Shirey thinks that Sidney Crosby is overrated. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
I mean, it, it's an it's a very nuanced. No, I, I, I get what you're saying. There's, there's a very nuanced conversation to have about it because, like I said, when he is dialed in and and is it's, playing, it's like, like he, he knows did. when to to. If you're looking at a ho- as your hockey abilities as like sliders. You know, he knows when to turn this slider up and this and not worry so much about this one. Very rarely does he get that wrong, but he's not perfect. He does get it wrong. He's not Right, and he's thirty six. Yeah. Like we nobody's sitting here pretending that he can go pedal to the metal no, for a full for, for a full game. Yeah, for a full game or full eighty two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh look, man, these next I mean the next time you and I sit down and and, and record a show, we're pretty much gonna know what's going on with the playoff picture. So um it's either going to be a post mortem or it's going to be a, a playoff preview, man. Like, it, hopefully, it's a playoff preview. Like they've I, I actually do too, been. Yeah. This is this is the most aside from the first few weeks of the season, but that that juice wore off real yeah, quickly. It, it's going to be fun. It, it's yeah. like there's just something about playoff hockey. Like there's, it's different than everything else. The the feeling in the air, the the atmosphere. You know, it's just different. And you know, it, it's there's a reason people say that the that the Stanley Cup playoffs are the the best playoffs in sports. There is a legitimate reason for that. And that's not even just hockey fans that say that. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I know you got to go home and, and handle your, your doggy, pups. Doggy duty. Yeah, I got to go home and uh, make sure my wife doesn't kill me for being home late. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um, check us out on all of the... All the stuff. All the stuff. And that'll be it for the Breakdowns and Breakaways podcast. We'll see you hopefully next week.